Hi, well, it's always great to be at Megalithomania and to talk about Earth energies at some of the sites that I love and know so well. I mean, Roll Right is a wonderful site, and like you said, we'll be visiting there on Monday. But the amazing thing about uh, Roll Right is, unlike Avebury and Stonehenge, it still retains its circular shape. So when a, a stone circle retains its circular shape, it behaves like a stone circle proper. Whereas when we have a, have a look at Avebury, for example, we can see that it's, uh, the stone circles there are ruinous. And even when we look at uh, Stonehenge, for uh, example, that stone circle is ruinous as well. So the ancients, energetically speaking, were building up energy on various different levels. Rollwright has been thoroughly looked at by Paul Devereux of the Dragon Project, and Paul Devereux is speaking at the conference today. So I'm not going to be touching on the Dragon Project. I'm going to be showing you my own research into the uh, energies of Rollwright. When we come to one of the most complete stone circles in the British Isles, we come to Swinside in Cumbria. It's really intact, and it's so intact most of the stones have, well, they've not been re-erected and set in concrete like at Avebury and um, Stonehenge. And Swinside has a special energy because of its circular shape. In fact, when I went there last year leading a tour, at a particular point, and we may feel this tomorrow at Roll Right for those that are going, when you walk into a stone circle in the correct manner through the avenue, you can often feel heat coming off the stones. So hopefully on Monday we'll actually feel that. The Roll Right complex consists of a stone circle that you can see. This is an antiquarian drawing by William Stukeley. And it has three stones towards the bottom, which are the Whispering Knights, and a standing stone called the Kingstone. It's made of uh, oodalite uh, limestone uh, stone, so it's kind of a bit more softer than, say, the sarsens of the larger stone circles like Avebury. And we're going to be looking at, in this presentation, who uh, laid out the ley line system, which I'll show you that was probably the long-headed uh, civilization which I discovered around Stonehenge. And we're going to be looking at some of the most powerful forms of Earth energy that Gaia and the Sun produce. And this is why a lot of ley lines line to the Sun. So we're going to be looking at, specifically at Rollwright, some of the most powerful energies and the stories behind them. This is an old photograph of Rollwright when it was literally surrounded by a Victorian metal fence. Thankfully, the fence has been taken down, but it still surrounds this type of fence in the uh, Whispering Knights and the Kingstone. It's almost like they're kind of in jail. And this is a lovely drone shot of Rollwright showing its really complete state with some crop circles in, in the background. But it's a perfect circular shape with a diameter of about 103 feet or 121, I think, megalithic yards of Alexander Tom. So we can see its amazing shape here. Now, to most people that visit Rollwright, you have a look at the notice boards at sites where you go. And at Rollwright, it will say that, you know, it's all associated to some witches, that uh, one witch in particular that turned all of the uh, st uh, people of an army and the King Rollo himself into stone. So it's about a witch really turning people to stone. And that's how you got the king's men. And that's why you've got the Kingstone, which was King Rollo, and the conspiracy of the Whispering Knights plotting against them. I mean, clearly that is just, you know, a Christian myth. But more than that, it really isn't associated with that, the, the Rollwright ring at all. And I think really it's, this only came about in the 19th century. So when you go to Rollwright and read that notice board, bear in mind it's probably very, very wrong, and that's quite recent. The, old, the original myth read, said the Danish general, if long Compton I could see, thou the king of England I should be. But replied the, and the British is raised there, Saxon general, then rise up hill and stand far stone, for king of England thou be none. 
So it's about men, not about women. <laughs> it's about men arguing about uh, a Dane over a Saxon. That's the reality of role right. But say something enough times, and it becomes a truth, even when it isn't. But the, these sculptures at roll right are quite beautiful, actually, of, uh, of the witches forming a circle there. It, it really is quite nice. Rollwright has an avenue, and it's very similar, the avenue at Rollwright, to the Cumbrian stone circles. In fact, you could have walked from the Humber right the way down to the Salisbury Plain by following an ancient Ridgeway track. And that track will naturally lead you to uh, Rollwright and, like I said, and beyond. But Rollwright must have had the same architects as the Cumbrian stone circles because they have four outlying stones like this, creating a very small avenue here at Rollwright. And that's the proper way to go into an ancient site. But at Rollwright itself, most people like cut across the stone circle. But if you go in the correct avenue, you're actually flown with the energy, as we will see. And the northern portal stones here at this avenue face the major southern moonrise, which happens around midsummer. So I think some of the stone circles weren't designed to be inside in the daytime. They were designed to be inside in the nighttime because the moon rises from the horizon line at Rollwright are spectacular. I've seen super moons there and I went to see the major southern moon rise, but unfortunately it was cloud. So the ancient architects wanted these alignments into these sites. So from the center, you would have seen the moon rise, and if you turned around, you'd be facing the largest stone in the Rollwright complex. So th this is the largest stone in the counting position. It's uh, stone number one. And uh, it literally is opposite that lunar alignment. So if the person or the group of people in the middle of roll, right, back on the, the day of that moonrise that only happens every 18.61 years, the moonlight would be targeting that stone. So it's a very special stone. It's placed in the northwest. And we're going to see in this presentation why the cardinal directions are very important in terms of energy. And who's been to the Roll Right Ring? Quite, quite a few of us. And it does feel powerful, doesn't it, as a, as a site. It may not have the height of the, the giant uh, stones of Stonehenge, but it has equal power. It's a very pokey place. And as we see, it's a place where you can manifest things as well and where things have manifested. This is a shot of coming up to the night time with the sun setting at Rollwright, and it really does change its energy from day to night. And that is one of the wonders of the Rollwright ring. Now, when we have a, a circular shape, and it doesn't matter what that circular shape is, it could be a circle of salt cast by an occultist. It could be a stone circle like the Merry Maidens in the top corner uh, on this slide. And it could be a, a, a ring of pebbles in your garden. It could be anything. The power of the circle has been known for centuries because it creates a particular type of energy. And this energy is called form energy, okay? And this is why occultists always would protect themselves in a circle, not just because it separates the sacred ritual from the profane outer areas, but because it creates an energetic wave, almost, of these concentric circles that we can see here on the presentation. So if you imagine that the shape of a circle generates concentric circles within itself and without itself. That's what uh, the power of the circle does. And when you have standing stones placed on the outside of that generated form energy, it really does make it very powerful. So an occultist, if they want to uh, manifest something, they know that if they walk roughly about four paces within inside this, uh, the circle they've cast of salt, or you're at roll right and you walk about four paces in, you'll be one on one of those energy bands, on one of those energy concentric stone uh, energy points. So this is what we'll be dousing uh, at Roll Right Ring on Monday. And if you hold a divining rod just in your hand and you do nothing, the rod really does react to this form energy. 
But a bit like occultists, if there's something that you want or need preferably, whether that's healing or whether that's something in your life, then these very powerful form energies can help you manifest that. And uh, there's been a lot of manifestation by people that have come on uh, group tours with me, and we can even do that on Monday. So, so take away everything, you know, even uh, the kind of, uh, some of the stones. And if you've got near enough a circle, then you have this energy. It's what gives life to a stone circle. And Avery doesn't have that. And Stonehenge doesn't have that because it's lost its circular shape. But like I said earlier, uh, sites like Swinside and the Merry Maidens have this uh, energy points. And it really is quite powerful. And what we'll do is we'll walk inside that stone circle could as well and try to feel for the energy with our hands as well as with a dowsing rod. And there's, all sites are associated with, uh, with ley lines. We, we know that, and we know a lot of them are aligned to the sun or the moon, or some would argue, like David Furlong, the stars of Orion's belt, for, for example. And in the 1970s, you had an author called Brian, uh, Guy Ragland Phillips who looked at all of the lays associated with his part of the country and uh, the north of England. And it was uh, Gary Billcliffe, who I know has spoken at Megalithomania on several, t uh, several times, researched the Bellinus line that uh, Guy Raglan Phillips discovered. And, he, and uh, Phillips thought this was like the, the spine of, uh, of, of England. But more than that, he mapped out, roughly speaking, every 12 miles, lays going uh, sort of in one way and then across the other, creating a grid of lays. So it's not just the Bellinus line that is associated with, with England. There are these numerous uh, lines. So it was very important, that was a real eureka moment in, in Lays because we thought there was just like one or two. And as Gary and Caroline her, point out in their book, The Spine of Albion, the, this Bellinus line is associated with earth currents. And these earth currents, they kind of avoid roll right, a <laughs> stone circle, which is quite strange because normally at places like Avebury and Stonehenge, they go <laughs> through the side. And Ellen, the female current that entwines the Bellinus Lay, she literally skirts the avenue. We'll be able to detect her outside the front. So why not go through a stone circle? And even when it comes to the Kingstone, they don't cross that stone either. It's away from it. And the only place where one flows through, which is the Bellinus line, is the Whispering Nights. So some earth energies avoid sites. And we normally find that when they avoid sites, it's because there's high energy going on the inside of that stone circle. So their energy may, be not, uh, may not be needed. So that's quite an interesting uh, concept, really. But you see, we're coming now to the who. When we look at these ancient sites, we're kind of overwhelmed with what, what the ancients left behind. But we know that that was a Neolithic site, the Whispering Nights. It's the remains of a long barrow, where in the first phase, long barrows were probably used for rituals. And then at a later date, in the second phase, they were probably used, as we, we've seen with uh, archaeological remains, the skulls and the long bones. And some flex skeletons were placed in the long barrows. But I do think there's two, two main phases to the long barrows. And that was a, a place there roughly, if we use orthodox dating, 3,800 BC. So it's one of the oldest monuments in the Roll, in the Roll Right complex. And it's been placed perfectly on the Bellinus current that uh, Gary Biltcliffe found. So that means if all the oldest Neolithic monuments are placed on Earth currents, then it must have been the people of the Neolithic that laid out and used the Earth energy system. And the people of the Neolithic in Britain and across Europe had very long skulls, as I've shown in previous presentations, such as the High Queen or High Priestess that I found in the Stonehenge environs. So I think because of their long skulls, they had immense sensitivity about the landscape. 
and they looked for these earth currents and lays. The oldest monuments on a lay system are Neolithic. It was then added to by the Bronze Age people, the Celtic people of the Iron Age, like the Druids, and then the Knights Templar, uh, and then the Christian churches. So, the, so lays now have multi-ages upon them, but strip all of that away and go back to the basis, and it's the long-skulled people. And when I was around one of the long skulls in uh, Cambridge University, and I'm, I think I'm quite a sensitive person, I put my hands by her throat chakra and uh, her third eye, I think their long skulls had two crown chakra energy points on them, making them very sensitive indeed. So when we think about earth energies now, think about it was originated by the long skulled people because theirs is the oldest monuments. Now, when it comes to the Kingstone, and we can see the Victorian kind of fence around it. A Victorian fence, incidentally, was put around the Kingstone because Welsh drovers used to pick off bits of the Kingstone for good luck amulets, and that's why it's got its twisted, distorted shape. At one time, it was probably more pillar-like and, uh, and taller, so it looks like it's kind of uh, leaning over uh, to one side. So in a way, you can understand why a fence was, you know, put up uh, around it. And uh, master dowsers over the past 30 to 40 years have located seven lays pumping into that stone, making it what's called a beacon stone. And that's where you get more than one lay going through. So again, most of the energy at Rollwright is focusing on an outlying standing stone and the whispering nights itself. And the Kingstone is by a very powerful point in the landscape that we'll come to later in a presentation, that if you need healing or if you need something really invigorating in your physical body, then this is the place to go. You don't need, you know, an hour therapy over this earth energy. You need 30 seconds and it would register in your body. And, uh, and that is a wonder. So this is an antiquarian drawing of what the remains of that long barrow, the Whispering Nights, was. It's much, much, you could have actually walked into it. William Stukeley did. He walked right through it, and today, again, it's around her like a cage with, with less stones. So, you know, over the past 200 years, we've lost so much of, uh, of our ancient sites. And even in the landscape that I live in, in 1996, and that's relatively uh, recent, isn't it? Uh, literally a whole long barrow on the downs was lifted up with a bulldozer and placed somewhere else. And that's in 1996, a scheduled monument. That should be seen as a scandal and a rape of our landscape. But right the way through here, we have uh, the Bellinus current. So I think it, the, the whole entrance and the, the sides of it were associated to the earth currents uh, here. But as Hamish Miller and others point out, don't forget, they're the major arteries. You have m different earth currents associated with those main currents anyway. So don't just see it as like Bellinus and Ellen. They're very sort of multi-faceted uh, that way. But even despite it being in this Faraday cage, <laughs> which kind of blocks out some of the energy, and that's interesting to note when something is surrounded by metal, it really does change uh, the frequencies. And we find this in ancient Egypt on some monuments as well. I was talking about the Kingstone being a receiver of energy. Now, it really is, because uh, I've mentioned before quite a few times the energy bands you get in stone, so I'm not going to touch upon them. But on tall stones, you get seven, two are below the ground. But on smaller stones, you get three energy bands that are really intense and very powerful. It's like the energy is concentrated yeah, in these small energy bands. Now, band number four on this diagram literally sends an energy beam across the air through to the kingstone. The kingstone is receiving all of this energy. It's called crosstalk in a, in a stone circle. And this can be measured. We measured it with, uh, with Rodney Hale, who was one of the original members of the Dragon Project, alongside uh, Paul Devereux. 
So we know this energy exists, and we roughly know the frequency that it's at. It's about 18 hertz. And if the uh, long-skulled people who uh, started to build the monuments, I think they, uh, we hear at 20 hertz, I think they could hear all of these energy lines, maybe buzzing as a low buzz going through, through it. So it creates this lay triangulation of energy, all focusing towards that one stone, making it literally uh, uh, an energy receiver. I wouldn't recommend it, and you shouldn't do it, but years ago, uh, some of us got a ladder and kind of climbed over into the Kingstone to, uh, to have a feel of, uh, of the energy. You know, obviously, don't do this at home, Blue Peter thing. Uh, and we, we went over it to get to that main energy point, and it was absolutely immense. It was sending some of our recording uh, equipment, you know, uh, off the scale. So what were the ancients up to here? If you then place another standing stone, which they did in the uh, Rollwright complex area, like on Spellsbury Down, you have the Hawk Stone, you have a lot of other outlying stones, you know, some of them up to 20 miles away, then this energy for this stone circle is now a single beam going from all of those multitude of 76 uh, stones or so go into the uh, kingstone, then being beamed across the landscape. So our ancient ancestors were generating a form of energy. Because if you put these standing stones generating form energy alone, and then into earth energy patterns we'll have a look at in a moment, the energy is coming up through the, the standing stones, and then being beamed to another stone, it's being beamed to another stone, all across the, the, the countryside. So it is a form of, of energy, and I think it's a form of free energy that the ancients were, were harnessing, and we've forgotten that. So energy triangulations don't happen that often. They do at Stonehenge, because you've got an outlier, and uh, at Avebury, the, you don't have energy triangulations anymore. But anybody that uh, knows the Avebury environs well knows that Avebury was surrounded by seven to eight outliers all across the downs. One of them still exists called a Long Tom, high on, on the downs. And there used to be about seven miles from Avebury, a massive 25 foot tall outlier receiving these uh, energy uh, beams across them. So the earth energy is being converted into aerial energy, okay, that is then beamed across the landscape. So this isn't uh, earth energy at all, this is aerial energy generated by the megaliths but born of the earth. I'm sure some of you have heard that the, uh, I think it was Paul Devereux actually, coined the, the phrase the spook road, which is the lane going round the kind of, uh, in front of the roll right ring. And uh, I know Paul Devereux did his own results uh, and on radiation levels uh, outside of this area. And uh, my late father did as well. But first of all, my late father used a dowsing rod to see if the dowsing rod could pick up exactly where the radiation levels were uh, without knowing where they were, like a blind run, uh, if you will. And uh, uh, he got constantly a hot spot. I was always a bit out, actually. I was out for about you know, three or four feet. Uh, in, in my Dowson, to be truthful, but he got it uh, bang on. And we think that represented a, a, a lost standing stone, another outlier that could have been creating that energy triangulation. Now, Rodney Hale suspects that that could be actually down to the basalt in the road. So it could be that hot spot because of tarmac and modern day equipment, but it could also be uh, that it was naturally generated there. When we come to a Neolithic monument that stood in front of Stonehenge, that massive Cursor's monument, nearly two miles long, at the near centre of that monument, you have one particular area where radiation is coming out of the ground. So it does feature gamma radiation, incidentally, which we know is quite dangerous to us. So were the master masons of the ancient world also physicists that could somehow transmute gamma radiation. 
Because when we go to the sanctuary near Avebury, William Stukeley's head of the dragon temple, the serpent temple, and you go to the middle of that very small concentric stone circle, which has no surviving stones, just concrete markers depicting the former positions of the standing stones, and you go to the centre, you have a massive outpouring of radiation. And you go outside, literally, 20 centimetres outside of that stone circle and the radiation levels all go back to normal. So it's not just at places like Rollwright, we're seeing radiation levels at numerous ancient sites. And I really do feel they were transmuting uh, this type of energy. And energy travels really fast in a straight line. Yeah? And that's why a lei is a power road of energy. And when we look to Chinese houses, they always have that beautiful horseshoe shape, don't they, on the roofs. And that's because they're trying to get the qi energy to slow down. So if you're on a lei at all, you're having a lot of fast energy coming into your house, which is probably classified as, as geopathic stress. But I had the great privilege a couple of years ago to take out an engineer from CERN. He was working as an engineer there. And he wanted to experience energy on a different level. So he thought, you know, he'd come to the Avery experience and had a private, you know, one-to-one -one with me. I found it very interesting that one of their experiments, which had nothing to do with the big circular particle generator, was to generate uh, a particle from CERN in a straight line straight to the Vatican. That was one of their first experiments. And you have to beg the question, you know, why is that? So the, these, everything travels really fast in a straight line, like that energy triangulation. And incidentally, you know, the Vatican, uh, it, it got its name from Vate, Vat, which is a, a, a druid order. You have like a bard, a ovate, a, a vat, as it used to be called, and then a druid. And the Vatican Hill was where all the druids used to meet to proclaim their prophecies and to divine. And uh, that was literally capped by, uh, by the Christian uh, church. Now, when we think of uh, ancient sites, we need to think of the energies that Gaia emits, okay? That's the, that's the main thing. You could put an ancient site anywhere, but it won't really have energy unless it's plugged into Earth energy and plugged into different types of grid systems, for example. And it was in the 1950s uh, that the Hartman grid was discovered by Dr. Hartman. It was uh, named after him. And you need to imagine that this grid system is roughly 2 metres by 2.5 metres, and it rises out of the ground. There's arguments about what creates it. Is it generated within the Earth? Is it generated by the ionosphere? But what Hartman did notice was that it does create this grid system. Now, it always used to be considered a benign grid system unless there was something big happening, like an earthquake, a massive thunderstorm, something like that, it, it was benign. I know quite, uh, quite a few very good Egyptian dowsers, okay? And what the Egyptian dowsers have noticed since the advent of 4G is that the energy of man-made signals, which we call e-smog, is now generating through the Hartman grid. Yeah, and this is before 5G uh, is coming, so be, be wary of that. Even in your house now, start to look where these are going, because if you're in your built-up area, you're bound to have e-smog coming through. And then the Egyptians are trying to uh, really look at uh, energy devices to counteract this at the moment. And I'll be talking more about some of the uh, uh, finds, because I think you know, the British can learn an awful lot from European dowsers and Egyptian dowsers, that's for sure. So what do megaliths and pyramids have with the Hartman grid? Well, it was the, the dowsers of Egypt that found that the pyramid, the Great Pyramid, is literally encased by the Hartman grid because the Hartman grid runs north to south and east to west, which is the layout of you know, the square base of the Great Pyramid. So that is defining its, its place in terms of the grid. 
and it's very easy to find. And we're going to have a go at doing this at Roll Ride. We're going to see which ones are plugged into the grid and how that makes a stone different from one that isn't plugged into it, for example. And we can see that these, these energy lines of the, the Hartman grid tend to meet roughly where the King's Chamber is, for example. And it was there in the King's Chamber that they realised they were in a neutral zone, but when they came out to redouse the Hartman encasement of it, that it had man-made signals, and they recorded it. The stones are made to transmit energy, like in that energy triangulation. That's what they're designed to do, absorb the Earth energy and spin it across the landscape. Engineer David Webb came out with me to the Royal Wright Stones about sort of four years ago, and he was picking up on man-made radio signals coming out of the standing stones. So we really have to take awareness of when we're interacting with Gaia's ancient sites, and I call them Gaia's ancient sites, even though our ancestors made them, is because they are, they're about the Earth energy there. So when we do uh, go to Roll Right, let's think about switching off our mobile phone and feeling the energies of the Roll Right ring rather than seeing it through the lens of a camera, okay? Because that's what David noticed, and we really do have to take responsibility, I think, because if the Egyptian dancers are correct and the Hartman grid is becoming infected with man-made signals, then other grid systems will do as well. So we can see that the Hartman grid was incorporated into the Great Pyramids and may have even dictated the King's Chamber. But standing stones by themselves react to the cardinal directions of north, south, east and west. So as much as the Hartman grid is going the same direction, if you imagine now you put a standing stone into the Hartman grid, but by itself the stones that aren't into the Hartman grid start to behave in a particular manner. They start to throw out energy north, south and east, west, which we'll have a look at in a moment. So we can see there is so much going on with one standing stone. It has its energy bands, it has lay triangulation, it has a Hartman grid, it has lays uh, going through it, but by itself, stones are very, very powerful. And these are called cardinal rays, for example. And the cardinal rays of a stone in good weather conditions go north, south, and west, and east. So they align themselves to these uh, directions and they throw out energy, which is either positive when in normal weather conditions, and some of that can, can link into the Hartman grid, but in unsettled weather conditions, it goes in between, like that big X shape. So there are two different phases of weather, and it's always been known by Master Down that if you start to douse in unsettled weather uh, um, phases, cycles, you get poor dousing results. And this is because these stones are reacting all the time to the weather, yeah? So, I mean, it's only been mooted yesterday on the TV about putting up, you know, all of these, like, mirrors in space to counteract, you know, global warming. The, these standing stones will start to react to weather, yeah, it's all about being a part of an environ, not just being isolated. But these cardinal rays that the stones shell out, if you will, they are, are very, very powerful. And they can go, they almost like go through your own body. And like I said, they have a positive phase and a negative phase. Has anyone doused here the cardinal rays? One person? <coughs> yep, and I know my dad taught you that, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to have a real go at interacting with some of uh, the energies uh, at Roll Ride, and it will be very good. And these, these are very powerful. And the size of the ray is di dictated by the size and the width of the stone. Okay? So at Roll Ride, they tend to be quite broad. But if you go to somewhere like Luxor or Karnak in Egypt, and you have like a massive obelisk stone, that cardinal ray now is going miles and miles uh, in its energy field. And we also have the curry grid. And, and rays. And the curry uh, net runs northwest, southwest, uh, and uh, towards the southeast as well to douse. 
Now, when a standing stone is in its positive phase, it links into the Hartman grid, and when it's in its negative phase, some of those cardinal rays link into the Curry grid, okay? But the Curry grid is always been known to emit geopathic stress, yeah? So if you lived above, if your bed was above one of those crossing points, you, you would behave in a particular manner. So the positive ones would make you feel more like you have rheumatism and the negative ones would uh, affect you in a different way. So why would the ancients plug a standing stone in in bad weather to feed into the curry grids? Well, German master doubters have noticed that the crossing points of some parts of the crossing points of the curry grid, for example, give off an electrical field, like a piezoelectrical field. So I think what the ancients were doing here is they, they were using the cardinal rays to feed into the curry grid to get some type of electricity. And lots of tests have been done in Germany to see how these affect you. In fact, one test alone was with 11,000 people. Yeah? That's a big test. And they were seeing, for instance, how you would relate to the curry grid and what your body was doing in its reaction and what it was found was you're linked into Gaia you're plugged into Gaia through a wave that comes from your solar plexus was the was the German research and they looked at this wave as being in good health about 50 centimeters away from me you know like a wave going in and it links into the earth and then when you're in a kind of geopathic stress zone, it, it goes it, twice as big. It goes to about a metre, 150 centimetres away from you. So they could start to predict ill health by just looking at your natural wave to Gaia. Yeah? And this was out of 11,000 people. It was found categorically that if you were around the curry net or you were uh, you know, fed into in a bad weather period by a standing stone, so maybe they're not the places to go in a thunderstorm, okay? Because that's when they're charging up to send out some type of uh, electricity. Their study showed that a third of all hospital admissions in two German towns were down to geopathic stress. So if you take that out of the NHS system, yeah, we've got an effective NH system, haven't we? And that was 11,000 people, yet their research has been ignored by the British. Is, is, is crazy. The Earth will affect us in so many different ways. And if it affects our wave pattern, our link into Gaia, is going to be affecting literally hundreds and hundreds of people. And also, it has been found by the Egyptians, the curry grid too will be flowing with 4G, man-made smog, and 5G uh, is coming. And uh, like I say, the Egyptians are really looking into how they can try to negate this, but it doesn't uh, seem that easy a process at the moment. So dancing uh, on a very practical level can make you live in a very safe part of your house. And today, we look at these lines and say, get your router off it, get your TV off it, don't add to the e-smog in your own surroundings, make it a very neutral zone, and then you will hopefully have a, have a long and very happy life. <laughs> now, the next type of energy we're going to be looking at is called an aquastat. Okay? And an aquastat energy was discovered by Guy Underwood in the 1940s, and he spent 20 years of his life plotting these energy lines at sacred sites across the world. But he never actually said what it was. He thought maybe it was a fissure system. Uh, he wasn't quite sure. And he thought maybe it was a dry fissure system that once ran with water, hence the term aqua, but was now static and dry, stat. And that's what he thought that was. But with my own research, I've delved a little bit deeper, and I think this is a particular type of water. As many of uh, people that follow my work will know, I often speak about the geospiral earth energy pattern found at the near center of most ancient sites around the world is the harmonic surface pattern of very deep water born within the earth, born within Gaia, completely independent of rainfall. 
yeah? That's a different type of water. So if we think of calling it one, yin water, born within Gaia, although old school dowsers will call that primary water, uh, but let's give it back its femininity, then the yang water that falls from the sky fills up the aquifers and the underground streams. Now, where I think an aquastat is flowing with very deep yin water in rivers and fissures throughout, uh, throughout the world, and it has 12 very fine lines of force, that if you cross this with a dowsing rod, you'd get 12 reactions, and you know that you would be on an aquastat because of these 12 fine reactions. But this type of underground water is very, very healing. When we've tested, you know, brainwave frequencies interacting with this energy, it puts you into alpha mode. But more than that, this type of underground water flowing within Gaia gives off a parallel, that's its mirror image, up to 15 and 30 feet away. The ancients were looking for this at every single ancient site. They were looking for yin water and yang water flowing. And we're going to have a look at the parallels now because it sets up a huge energy field up to about 100 feet wide. Now this is uh, the flow pattern of underground yang water, that's the water that falls from the heavens and fills up the aquifers. And we can see that the stream band is three lines in, uh, flowing in the landscape above the actual stream. And to either side you have what's called the parallel force. Now, back in the 1700s, you had a bishop that said, well, if I'm on the middle uh, central stream band and I walk out and I get a dowsing reaction on the parallel force, and let's say that's 50 feet away, that means that stream is 50 feet below the ground. Yep, it was called a, it's the bishop's rule for water divine in methods. But in actual fact, what's happening is those, uh, and it, those parallel force fields are becoming circular. Yeah, and generating a massive wave like that. So this type of underground water is carcinogenic to live above. It's, it's geopathic stress, like the, the curry net uh, is. But when it flows with yin water, it becomes very, very harmonic. Now, if you're lucky enough to have an aquastat close to your home or in your home, you can go to it and interact with it and get a literally healing uh, energy from that. It will make you very relaxed and calm, and which is very good for the physical body. Now, when these two streams meet, they're called holy lines, and that's what Guy Underwood call them. So when you get the male and the female waters, that's uh, considered quite harmonic. And it's been noticed that when two of these streams flow, the yin water gives the geopathic stress water its kind of better force. It makes it, it transmutes it from literally lead into gold, from being geopathic stress into something really positive. So for me, the earth force, the ancient site, we can interact with these energies today. Yeah? We can look in the landscape, where are these energies? And if we know anyone that is ill or suffering in any way, we can take them to an aquastat or a geospiral and get self-healing. I'm not saying it's a cure-all at all, but I'm saying it can help uh, the body to heal itself uh, for sure. And I also have had very personal experiences. I, you know, I might look healthy. Well, some of you might not think I look healthy. But uh, I do have a, an awful lot of um, physical problems. So when I, when I go down uh, with something, because I, I can have run the risk of having a stroke at any time, I've got thick blood, I've got this, I've got that. But what I have found is working with earth energy has definitely, definitely helped to keep me off mainstream meditation. Uh, medication rather. So I think it's very important that you know we work with the earth force. Now Tom Graves was an excellent dowser. He wrote a book which was really great called uh, Needles of Stone. And when he was at Rollwright, he noticed that one particular stone was like offset compared to the rest of the stones. And I showed you at the beginning of this presentation the form energy that a stone circle can uh, produce, didn't I? Well, imagine that now spinning round and round and round and round and round. And when it hits an offset stone, it goes spinning across the landscape to the next stone. That's the power of a stone circle proper. Walk around Avebury's great stone circle. You'll find the, what he called Tom Graves, the exit gate. 
and you will find that it's spinning off at Avebury there, although not to this degree because it hasn't got its circular shape anymore. So Rollwright really does overproduce energy, doesn't it? We've seen so much energy going on there. That's why it doesn't need an earth current like Ellen or Bellinus going through it because it literally is a power, a powerhouse. And incidentally, this has been dated to the late Neolithic or the early Bronze Age. Uh, pick that one as you will. But I actually think it's uh, quite a bit older than that. I think the timeline is wrong for most of our ancient sites uh, in, the, in the UK. <laughs> Certainly, uh, places like Oxford University, they're actually really thinking the timeline could be really wrong. So I think we need to think about them being much, much older and putting a lot of the sites into the long-skulled people's civilization of, uh, of designing some of these sites and finding the earth energies. It's really interesting, and this is Tom Graves' work again, where if you put a pendulum above a standing stone at Rollwright, it will spin normally in one direction, then it will go into like a dwell contemplation, and then it will spin around in the opposite direction. And uh, he noticed that certain stones were twinned, and there was this energy on the top of the stone, but what caused it, he didn't know. He just thought it was you know, some kind of uh, energy from the stones. But what I noticed was, if you look to back, and as indeed my late father did, to when telephones were just coming into fashion big time, what they, the engineers realized, there was this parasitic, they called it a parasitic earth current, I wouldn't, <laughs> they called it a parasitic earth current that was interfering with the telephones. So they had to put relay switches in and really counteract this earth energy from the, their phones. And this is what I think it is, and these are called earth voltages. So Gaia, in certain parts of a stone circle, or indeed at your house, for instance, or your garden, creates these areas of massive voltage activity that if you place something above it, like a standing stone, that too reacts to it. And Tom Graves puzzled over, why does it go 30 circles my pendulum one way and then 30 circles in the other? And they do the same again and repeat it on that cycle. And that's because these earth voltages, they do repeat that cycle continually. So our ancestors, could, could literally decode the earth. They knew about the voltages, they knew how a stone circle creates energy, they knew about earth currents and lays, and they put all of this into a stone circle to create a powerhouse, and they were looking for aquastats and underground water. So when somebody says to me, well, what's at roll right? I always say, well, what is it at roll right? It's that much of a, a powerhouse. And this is the wavelength of an earth voltage. It will literally go one way and then come back the other way. And that's very well known to most engineers that work with the earth in any way. And the ancients were harnessing uh, this energy, and I'm sure in a long lost technology. So now I want to spend a little time thinking about how the sun influences earth energy. Okay, the esoteric colors of the sun. When we think about the sun and the earth, we think about growth, don't we? Plant life, growing, etc. But Gaia is very linked into the sun, and the earth energies are linked into the sun as well. And two French diviners at the turn of the last century, well, about the 1930s, actually looked very closely into devices of pendulums that they found in ancient Egypt, for example. And they noticed that in the Valley of the Kings, that quite a few of the mummies had this pendulum uh, buried with them. So the, so the French took the, took the pendulums, rightly or wrongly, you know, they, there's a ransack in Egypt in a way, and they took the pendulums and decided to work with them and to see what would happen. Okay, so they were going on ancient uh, pictures uh, in the Valley of the Kings and elsewhere. And here's one of the uh, energy devices. This is the Karnak uh, pendulum, which looks like a bullet. And that's the Isis pendulum there. And Egypt has the same energies, remarkably so, or well, one energy that Rollwright does. 
So they found these devices in the Valley of the Kings, so they thought, well, let's work with it and see what we can do with them. And I would advise you that if you're going through uh, an Egyptian airport like Luxor, that if you're taking that Karnak pendulum, and incidentally, these unscrew. You must only use these devices, and I've got some with me for those that want to see them. You unscrew them when they're not in use, and you screw them up when they are in use because they're generating frequencies of the Earth and Sun that we'll see in a moment. But I went through with the bullet-looking one, not the one with the bars on them, through uh, Luxor Airport, and uh, they thought I was a terrorist with a bullet. And I thank God for the Egyptian guide. He was saying, no, 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 it's a pendulum, it's a pendulum. But they stopped everything. They really did think that was, uh, that was a bullet. Well, that's called the bullet ones like the Karnak pendulum, and the other is the Isis. There's a, a male and female system. And when you go to places like Abydos, you see this uh, energy device uh, all over the place, the Isis uh, pendulum. And then when you go to uh, temples like uh, Komombo off the, the Nile, you see people holding the Karnak energy device. You may not see this too clearly, but from the bottom of the Karnak pendulum flows the life force of the Ankh. Yeah? They're kind of healing around people with these energy devices. So they took the pendulums back to France, to Paris, and decided to do some tests. And Chaumery, he was in the laboratory on his own. He was a, a fantastic master dowser and very learned scholar as well. And he filled an object up with one particular frequency called the negative green, and he was found a week later mummified in the laboratory. These are very, very, it went down in dousing history, yeah. And very few dousers know how to work with the negative green. Negative green is generated by pyramids, for example, dome-shaped, which was all throughout the ancient world, corbelled uh, roofs. Uh, so they were, you could generate negative green, but the sun is given negative green. The sun is interacting all the time with Gaia's energies. And here we have uh, the Valley of the Kings, lots of rows of the Karnak pendulum going down here. Very, they're very, very beautiful. And this is where they got dimensions from the French. They literally measured all of these pictures in the Valley of the Kings to get the right dimensions for the Karnak pendulum. And it, it is a very powerful pendulum. It's, it's used to uh, heal on a very dramatic level. So what the, the French were looking for is you have the sun, and the sun gives out the seven color rays, doesn't it? Which we're all familiar with, red through to violet. And then it has some shades that you can't see, you could feel like uh, infrared and ultraviolet, doesn't it? We know that if you put a prism up to the sun, they're the colors of the rainbow that you would get, correct? Yeah. But in terms of uh, e esoteric uh, dowsing, you have other colors besides that. You have infra black infra white, the negative green at the bottom. Now, when the sun is at the top, and we imagine the day section is England at the moment, let's say, and you've got Australia in the night spectrum, then when the sun's rays come in through at noon, for example, when the sun is at its zenith, then the ray of green they found comes down. But when that ray of green goes through the night phase, it comes out the other side as negative green. Now imagine that sun ray is coming down and then it finds pockets in the earth coming up like that. That's the, uh, the force of negative green. So after Chaumery's death, they decided that they would experiment further but not to fill an object with the ne negative green. And there was an English uh, dowser, and what he did, I don't advocate testing on animals in any way. I'm a vegetarian, and I buy beauty products not tested on animals. But nonetheless, they got a whole load of French edible snails and decided to see if the Egyptian pendulum uh, devices could withdraw the life force. Yep. So they withdrew the life force and then put the life force back in. And sadly, one of the testers, his wife developed breast cancer. So what he thought he would do was he would suspend the life force of the tumor, okay? You don't have to cut anything out, you don't have to do anything, you suspend the life cells. And, uh, and he did that and he was very, very successful. 
So why don't we hear more about Egyptian pendulum dancing? Yeah? Only a few people are, are trained in it. Why? What went wrong? We should be now, at the time of dowsing, in a much, much, much bigger level. But we went backwards. What happened in the 1960s was information, pendulum, dowsing, as we know it, became very fashionable because it was easy. You hold a pendulum up, we've all done it, haven't we? And you ask it a question, yes, no. Do you know what I mean, don't you? Information, pendulum, dowsing. And that became really very popular because you've got to be trained to use an ISIS pendulum. You've got to be trained to use a Karnak pendulum. So that went underground. In fact, the whole French laboratory started to go underground. It wanted nothing to do with psychic dowsing, as they called it. That's what they uh, phrased it. I would call it information dowsing. And they kept their manuscripts to themselves and were waiting for a person to come along that they could give the manuscripts to. And it just happened to be uh, a couple of uh, Egyptians, which should have been or should have been uh, put back into Egypt's hands, and they started to, to develop uh, more on with the negative green of working with it in houses and things like that. Although the information on how it could suspend the life force was sadly lost. So now I want you to see the sun having all of these colours, being able to produce this colour that comes up out of the earth, and when you have the sun and the, the earth in sync with those colours, wow! you have a powerhouse of colour energy and frequency at an ancient site. And again, this is what our ancestors were seeing. They weren't seeing a lay as being a line on a piece of paper, like maybe some of us here do. I know I used to. But they saw it as colour coming out of the ground, interacting with them, with the sun, with the earth, with the life force that you could suspend or not suspend. In my training with the, with the negative green, that has been over quite a few years now, I've only actually ever seen it employed like that once before, and it did save uh, a life of, a, of an animal. But it's uh, very difficult to, uh, to describe it. So when we come back to some energies that we think we're very familiar with, like the Mary and Michael lines of Hamish, Miller, and Paul Broadhurst fame, we need to see that they have a frequency and a colour that dominates, okay? <coughs> now that colour frequency that the Master Dao say, I'm going to give the chakra system as an example, we have a red base chakra, don't we? And it goes up to violet, yep, that's the chakra system. But to, to a diviner of an Egyptian pendulum, they say no, all of the colours, you cannot separate one colour. If you put a prism up to the light, you can't separate red. So they say all the colours prevail, including the negative green in your chakras, but red dominates, okay? And so up and so forth with the chakra system. And it was noticed with uh, Paul and uh, Hamish that the colour frequencies of Mary and Michael are Mary has blue dominant colour frequency and Michael has ultra white colour frequency, for example. So again, we need to kind of think there's much, much more to Earth energy that goes on. Each has a colour and each has a frequency that can bring your colours and frequencies into harmony. And we can see that there's blues and, and whites depicted uh, here. And when we move on, we can see that very close to the Kingstone is an area where as the light comes down from the sun, a pocket of negative green comes up and that creates an area of immense healing. And like I said, when it comes to this colour frequency of earth energy and sun energy, you don't need an hour therapy. 30 seconds or more is all you need to be uh, helped to be healed by the negative green energy force. And that's what's being generated by some of the Egyptian pendulum devices. They can generate particular colour frequencies to charge up food, for example, to charge up water, to charge up your auric field, your health, uh, and they are uh, very uh, powerful. But those that are coming out to roll right with you and myself can experience finding the negative green in the landscape 
and interacting with its uh, energy zone. And you will feel it. Something happens to the physical body when you enter this energy field. So I'll guide you towards it and then see if your body reacts to it. And then you know that you are filling up with a slight bit of the negative green force. Not enough to be mummified. You're safe in my hands. <laughs> you coming to the end, Hugh? A couple of minutes. Yes, yeah, so uh, just to finish off about the colour frequency, this is another one of Hamish Miller's and um, Paul Broadhurst map of uh, a lay that goes all the way uh, through the landscape. It is encoiled by uh, some energies here of um, Athena and Apollo, and they too have colour systems. And it's known that the Apollo is red and the ultraviolet is of the female one. So these are very healing. When I was in Athens, for example, uh, I, I was at Delphi, actually, and I twisted my ankle, and it swelled up, and I couldn't walk for a day, but I decided I was going to hobble up to the Acropolis if it was going to kill me, and put myself into negative green. And I was with a, a friend that a lot of you know called Busty, and he was going, oh, you're stupid, you're stupid, you shouldn't do this, you know. But I went all the way up, and nobody got out of my way, and I was hobbling around uh, people, put my foot into, and it was like this, into that negative green zone, and it instantly de-swelled it. So that I could go, I was still hobbling, I was still in pain, but I could go back down in less pain than I went up. So I hope this presentation has showed you a more about Earth energy than meets the eye and there's far more to the energy of the sun meeting Gaia's energy than at first glance we can understand. Put all of that together at a place like Rollwright or Stonehenge and you have celestial energies pouring into the site and indeed into your own being. Thank you.